Hey everyone. In this video, I want to talk about bare metal infrastructure on Azure. I've mentioned it in the past in some of my other videos for five seconds, but never really explored what it is or why I would use it. And so in this video, I want to dive into that. If I think of regular Azure, as we know, we talk about the cloud, but it's powered by servers. I can think I have my regular physical hosts of all different types with different maybe ratios of CPU and memory and local capabilities, but there's a host there. And if we think about layers, we always think about, well, in the cloud, at minimum, if I think of things like compute, uh, the network, storage, and the hypervisor, that is always the responsibility of the cloud provider. So in this case, Azure. So I think on this physical host, 99.99% of the time, well, it's running Hyper-V. That's the Microsoft hypervisor that's running directly on that bare metal. Then it uses a very small uh, Windows partition as its management partition. But it is the Hyper-V hypervisor runs directly on the bare metal. And that management partition sits on top of that hypervisor. And then, of course, you have the other layers, things like the operating system, the runtime, your application, your data that we see all the time. But this line is always the responsibility of the cloud provider. And then, hey, maybe it's IaaS, maybe it's PaaS, as you go up those regular layers. All of the interactions are always via the Azure Resource Manager. That is the control plane. And that gives us a huge number of fantastic capabilities. We always think about, well, we have Azure policy that sits at the entrance of that control plane, role-based access control. Again, I cannot bypass that, be it the portal, CLI, PowerShell, template, everything goes via this control plane. I get tagging, I get various types of extensions, I get meters, I get observability, the list goes on, I get all those things from ARM. And it gives us this consistent way to do everything we want to do. So we want to use this. So what is this other thing? What is this idea of infrastructure, bare metal services on Azure? Well, the idea here is that I have some workload, some specific type that this is just not a fit for. For potential reasons such as, well, maybe they don't want Hyper-V there. They want to do their own hypervisor. Or maybe, and this is actually shifting to not become such a big issue, there were some very, very specific requirements they add in the hardware. Maybe from a size perspective, or maybe the types of interactions it required with the hardware. So the key point is there is very, very specific workloads that this model and this interaction maybe is not a good fit for. And when we think about this bare metal infrastructure on Azure, it is not just some generic service that everything can use. Hey, I can just go and get a bare metal server. It is specific to workloads that Microsoft have partnered with vendors and enabled them to have some bare metal offerings. And if we go and look at the page super quickly, if we look at the bare metal infrastructure on Azure documentation and look at the workloads, we can actually see there's only two. SAP HANA on Azure large instances and Nutanix cloud clusters or NC2. And what's interesting if you go and look at this is for example, the SAP HANA, notice it's in sunset mode. That is not the case for the Nutanix. The Nutanix is very much an offering that's being continued to build on. And I think that is a, a key point that we always want to think about. So the SAP HANA large instances, the bare metal was, hey, it just required these huge, huge virtual machines, huge amounts of memory, huge amounts of processors, bare metal performance. 
But if you look at the advancements in Azure, sure, the bare hypervisor has gone through many enhancements, but if you look at accelerated networking, hey, I'm not going through a virtual switch anymore in the management partition, I'm going directly into programmable FPGAs, the networking controllers, those virtual functions, I get essentially bare networking performance. You look at things like the new NVMe disk controllers we're starting to see on some of the new EV5, but we'll see that rolled out, again improves the performance of those. And so we also now have these just massive virtual machines. If we go back for a second, if I was to look at the SAP HANA and its certified supported infrastructure, well, the new M, the monster size virtual machines, look at this M832 V2 and some of the others, I mean, look at the amount of memory they have. 23,000 gigabytes. And obviously these have just a massive number of virtual CPUs as well. So the point here is that, hey, it doesn't necessarily require that bare metal infrastructure anymore. It can just use those really large virtual machines that exist in Azure. And that's always gonna be my preference. If I can, I would rather just use regular Azure because that Azure Resource Manager control plane gives us those standard features that enables me to interact and manage it in a consistent manner. That's always going to be my first preference if I can. Okay, but let's talk about the Nutanix. Nutanix is a really good example because they do have very specific requirements that would not fit well on the regular Azure fleet today and definitely not going to run on top of Hyper-V. Now, I do want to point out a key issue here is that the bare metal infrastructure on Azure, the Nutanix offering, is a Nutanix offering. That's the key difference between something like the Azure VMware solution where Microsoft installs the EXI, ESXi hypervisor, they go and get the VMware licenses, they build the VMware private cloud and then sell it directly to customers. So Azure VMware solution is still a first party Microsoft offering. Nutanix is a third party offering. It is Microsoft offering the bare metal infrastructure to Nutanix and then Nutanix runs their stack on top of it and sells it to their customers. That's why it's different from something like the Azure VMware solution where it's Microsoft offering. So let's look at what's actually happening for the Nutanix, because it's a good way to understand some of the differences and how those interactions may vary. So it's called bare metal. So obviously we know there must be some bare metal involved. So I'm gonna start off just by drawing three bare metal hosts. Now today on Nutanix, it's really offered in one SKU, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the minimum number we can have is three nodes. I have to have at least three. The maximum today is 13. So between three and 13 nodes. And this is a hyper-converged offering. So all of these nodes have local NVMe storage. and then using its own network, storage, software stacks, it makes that replicated and available throughout all of the nodes. So these are all bare metal. Now what happens here is there's a special top of rack switch that these nodes get connected to. And it's this top rack switch that's gonna power quite a lot of what happens. So Microsoft prepares the bare metal host. They may put a minimum OS on it initially. Uh, maybe there's a minimum sent OS, for example, just to enable basic management communications and then for Nutanix to do its thing. Now these are Dell R640s today. If we go and actually look at the offerings, the SKU supported, we can see, yep, it's this half a terabyte of RAM, 72 virtual CPUs, and then you can see that NVMe storage that it's gonna use for a lot of the actual storage of the virtual machines and their assets. And that is a key point. It's going to use 
the storage that is native inside those nodes. It is not going to go and be able to use a managed disk. That, that's an ARM resource. It has no access to those sorts of things just by default. So we have these nodes. Now what's going to happen initially is Nutanix. So Nutanix are providing the solution. So what happens here is Nutanix have a virtual network. And you can think, for example, in there, there's a bare metal subnet. There's various things that's going to happen on your network as well that you have to delegate over to the bare metal service. But initially, what's going to happen is a tunnel using VXLAN. VXLAN. So between the top of rack switch and Nutanix's virtual network, it establishes a VXLAN. And this is so that initially, it can send things like the host IPs that these will then leverage. So it has to have management capabilities to them. So again, remember, this is a Nutanix offering. So initially, those hosts get offered to Nutanix. Nutanix can go and do those things. So the Nutanix engineers then go and configure the nodes. Now, the first thing they're going to have to do is install their hypervisor. So on top of these nodes, it will install AHV. So AHV is the Nutanix Acropolis hypervisor. So it is not Hyper-V, that's kind of a key difference here on why they couldn't just use regular really big VMs. It doesn't want to run on top of Hyper-V, it needs to be running that hypervisor directly on the bare metal. And then they can go and install the rest of their compute, their network, their storage stacks. It creates a Nutanix compute cluster. That is now the offering. We now have this NC2, Nutanix compute cluster. Well, now we need to bring it into the customer's environment. So if that was the Nutanix VNet. Now I want to think about, well, now I'm the customer. So obviously now the customer has their virtual network. Now there are specific subnets they need and they're going to delegate them to particular offerings to enable this to work. But what will happen is after they've installed this hypervisor, they're going to reboot. So it's been set up, it's going to reboot, and when it does the reboot, we're now going to swing over and have a tunnel going to here, which means now they're going to get their host IPs from a particular subnet in the customer's virtual network. So it's swinging over to now enable the customer's VNet because it's now up and running. It's set up. All of the customer experience, including ordering this thing, obviously the VNet they create using the regular Azure portal and setting the role-based access control for Nutanix, that delegation, but everything is using Nutanix tooling. The onboarding of the solution, and the ongoing management is all through Nutanix. Now for this to actually function, because remember, these are bare metal running a different hypervisor. It's not speaking regular ARM at all. It's not running the Azure software defined networking stack, which is how everything else normally communicates. Instead, it's had this special VXLAN tunnel because this special connection to a special top of rack switch. So the first thing we have to have is there is something called a flow gateway that gets installed in your virtual network. So you have a flow gateway. It's this flow gateway that then enables these and the VMs you create on top of this, so let's say I create a VM over here, to then communicate with other VMs and offerings you have inside your virtual network. So that's going to facilitate all of those communications with other things. Now it can also, once you have that, 
communicate to, let's give myself a bit more space, if I had another virtual network. So maybe I've also got a, a second VNet, so I've got VNet2, and I've peered these. Now, a key point though is they have to be regional peer. So it could enable communication to resources in another virtual network in the same region as this VNet, but it does not support global peering. So if I try to peer it to uh, a VNet in a different region, obviously the peering would work, the communication would not. The Flow Gateway would not facilitate communication to another virtual network that was not in the same region. That is not going to work. Additionally, what about if these things want to be able to talk to the internet? We take for granted that, hey, I create a VM or service in a virtual network in Azure and it can just talk to the internet. Different things come into play. Sometimes there's an automatic public IP is utilized. Maybe I'm behind a standard load balancer that is a public front end. That doesn't apply here. So I have to have a NAT gateway. Now, a NAT gateway is something I can use for regular workloads that now gives me a very prescriptive and determined public IP that all of my communications to the internet will go through. It's an option. This is now mandatory. So I have to have a NAT gateway because that's what's going to enable it to go and talk to the internet. So the NAT gateway is going to facilitate these talking to things on the internet, including many Azure services. If I wanted to go and talk to a storage account, I'm going to go and flow through this because as we're actually going to see, today things like private endpoints do not work. If there was a private endpoint sitting in here, these cannot talk to it. Once again, we take for granted what's happening behind the scenes, but it's all software defined networking, which these are not part of to make those things work, they have to program all of that communication into there to actually make it function. Now, also what's gonna happen is maybe this has gateways or it's connected to a VNet that has the gateways, but if I have my various types of gateway, this could now talk to site-to-site -site VPN, it could be talking to express route. Those will all work as well. So all of these things will function and enable all of the connectivity. Now there are other components. Um, there's actually a Nutanix Prism Central software appliance get in, gets installed within here. So also within here, there is this Nutanix software virtual appliance that then enables me to use the Nutanix uh, Prism tooling to actually interact and manage all of this. Remember, that's how we're gonna manage and create all these VMs. It is not via Azure tooling, it's via the Nutanix portal. That's how I do this. There's also gonna be this software virtual appliance gets installed within here. And that, that's how it's all working. Now, in terms of the details on which features do or don't work, if we jump over, and look at the supported topologies, we can see it talks about, hey, peered VNet is a yes. Let's just zoom in a little bit differently. But cross region is a no. Obviously I need to have that delegated subnet for the gateways, express route, good. Fast path does not work today. Remember, FastPath is that technology that lets me bypass the gateway for the ingress from my on-prem, for example, via the Microsoft Enterprise Edge directly to a resource. That doesn't work. So it's always gonna flow via the gateway. If we keep going down, it talks about the different types of gateways that are or aren't supported. But then if we look at the constraints, NSGs don't work user-defined routes don't work, private endpoints don't work. Load balancers do not work. It's only IPv4. 
So some of those things that we're just used to taking for granted will not function in this because again, it's not part of that standard software defined networking. So those things will not function. So all that said, why would I do this? Yeah, you're looking at this going, okay, there seems to be a lot of constraints. Why would I ever actually want to utilize this if I could just use my nice regular Azure services? And as I said at the start, that would be my preference. In a, everything is equal, if I want resources in Azure, I want to use something that is ARM-based. I want to use that. The same goes for the Azure VMware solution. Azure VMware solution would not be my first choice. I would much rather use first party native ARM solutions where I get all of the regular capabilities, all that software defined networking integration. But Azure VMware solution, well, I might use that because, hey, I'm used to VMware. I'm in a hurry to get out my data center. I want to be able to use my existing tooling. So, hey, I'll use the Azure VMware solution. Well, a very similar thing happens here. Today, maybe I'm using Nutanix on premises and I want to quickly get out of my data center, but I want to maintain using my existing skills, my existing tooling. I can migrate my private cloud to the Azure public cloud ecosystem. And then I can actually migrate the virtual machines. So I would use this solution if I'm a Nutanix customer today and I just want to get out of my data center, but I do not want to retool today. I don't want to have to relearn other things because when I'm using this bare metal infrastructure on Azure for Nutanix, I really don't need to know much about Azure. All of my interactions is still via Nutanix. So, hey, I'm a Nutanix customer, but I want to get out of my data center. Or maybe I want to start taking a step towards the cloud. This is a solution for that. Or maybe there's a solution that only runs on Nutanix. It's some Nutanix tightly coupled partner solution that I have to have Nutanix. But I'm in the cloud and I want to stay in the cloud. Well, I could use this bare metal infrastructure on Azure Nutanix clustering to then run that solution in the Azure infrastructure. So that's the why. It's not the, ooh, I want to use the public cloud, let's use Nutanix, or let's use the Azure VMware solution. I'll always, if I can, prefer to use the native ARM-based resources because I just get all of these great interactions and all of the functionalities. It's just there, I, I can expect that. But there are gonna be cases where, hey, I just wanna get out my data center. I'm a VMware shop, I'll go Azure VMware solution. Hey, I'm a Nutanix shop, I'll go to Nutanix solution. Or I'm using some technology that is tightly coupled to those other hypervisors. Well now, hey, be it ESX or be it Nutanix, I can do that. But again, remember, Azure VMware solution is a first party offering. It is Microsoft that sets up EX, ESX, oh, I've got a problem with that for some reason, that sets up the private cluster that makes it available to you. But even then it's not integrated with our regular SDN. You have things like, hey, it uses Express Route, global reach to connect things together. And there's other things that have to happen. Nutanix is a third party offering. I order it through Nutanix. They work with Microsoft to onboard their solution and then they provide it to the customer. But if you have that need, hey, I'm Nutanix today. I wanna get out of my data center or I've got some solution that only works on it. This is what it's for. So hopefully that helps explain it. I, as a regular customer, cannot just go and say, hey, I want a bare metal server on Azure. They are not gonna give you that. They're not gonna sell it to you. And even if they did, it would be basically useless. Because if you just had a bare metal box sitting in an Azure data center, it won't talk to anything else. You'd have probably no way to actually manage the thing or get to it. There's a very specific set of requirements to make it useful in any way because everything else is these software defined networking stacks and the compute and the connectivity. So Microsoft have partnered with these specific companies to enable things like, hey, Flow Gateway with ESX. Oh, okay, well, we have the Express Route Global Reach to make it look like it's really going via Meet Me to make these things connect and function. So that's it. I hope that made a bit of sense. 
Until next video, take care.